Yo, boss lady. And aware of everybody's time. Again, thank you for joining us this morning for our first of two facilities roundtables that the Region 4 Facilities Committee will be hosting during our uh, virtual conference this week. Today's conversation will be centered around indoor facility operations. Um, and then later this afternoon, we have an outdoor focused facility roundtable as well. Uh, for representing the Region 4 Operations or Facilities Committee this morning will be Taylor Crabtree from the University of Arkansas, Glenn Kemper with the uh, Logan University in St. Louis, and I'm pinch hitting for Blair Schuyler at uh, Kansas, but I do want to at least recognize him for his hard work uh, throughout this time. Um, but uh, something came up with him, and so I'm, I'm pinch hitting, so I apologize that you have to deal with me. My name is Ross Rodriguez. I'm with the University of Texas at Austin. So today, what we're going to talk a little bit about, first, before we get started, as always, we want to thank our sponsors. Without them, this conference wouldn't have been possible. Um, so again, please take time, if you can, uh, to visit all of our sponsors and, and see how they might be able to help you with your operations and, and at your campus. So today, uh, we also want to make sure that you're aware of our Region 4 social media posts and tags. Uh, it's a great way for you to reach out and post pictures of dogs of Region 4. Uh, I know that I think Jeremy posted his two pit bulls yesterday, which are beautiful animals. Um, I decided not to, to post mine because she's just not you know, appropriate for social media anymore. Um, so she's on the DL. Please feel free to follow us on all of our social media uh, avenues. And then finally, we also want to say thank you to the Region 4 Communications Committee. They've been doing a great job getting the word out about all the things we're going to talk about this week. So our light agenda for our conversation this morning is we're going to talk about uh, things involving our student employees. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about indoor spaces and the allocations and how they're being used, the maintenance of those spaces, and any custodial uh, topics you might want to have a conversation about. We could touch on risk management, and then if there's any burning questions that you might have throughout this morning's conversation, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I think Taylor and Glenn and I will be uh, monitoring that and trying our best to keep up with your notes and your questions. Um, so if everyone's ready to go, you're settled in, you've got your favorite beverage of choice, uh, we'll get started. So Taylor, take it away, sir. So the first thing we kind of wanted to uh, prompt you all with and get going with is uh, related to student employees and operations. So the main thing being budgets. Um, I know if you're like we are here at Arkansas, we're experiencing like an increase of how we're having to staff the building with our student staff. And that's really affecting our budget right now. So we're kind of curious, like what you all are doing, uh, like what you're seeing from that right now. What are your plans for adjusting to that? And maybe any questions you have related to that as well. No question is a dumb question here. We're all here to help each other. So just anything, any question, anything you can point out from what you're doing right now would be helpful. Well, I can get oh, Go ahead. A any concerns of what other people are doing or how you're doing it? You feel uncomfortable and unsure what you're doing? I mean, this is a good time to, you know, get a discussion and talk to your peers. Yeah, this is uh, Jeremy Chance with University of Kansas. I know one of the things that we are, um, maybe not necessarily struggling with. I think our budget, for, as far as from a student hourly perspective, is was pretty um, is staying stable. But one of the things that I was concerned with um, is just as far as our usage. You know, we we staffed um, probably as we would a normal semester, not knowing how to anticipate or what usage would look like. Um, and, and right now through most of the, the fall semester, we've been at about half capacity. So, so there's actually a lot of times where, you know, we've got student staff kind of standing around or, or not utilizing them effectively. Um, so I think one thing that I'm struggling with is like, well, I don't necessarily want to take hours away from students that have already, you know, guarantee, you know, banking on those throughout the semester, but at the same time, you know, there's not much traffic through the building. So I think one of the, the challenges that I'm going to have um going into the spring semester even over the break too is trying to determine like okay, what balancing the right number of staff on shift at any given time and you know utilizing our connect to data our you know fusion counts to balance 
best utilize that, but I know that's just kind of a, a challenge, you know, anticipating what usage is like in an in a unpredictable time. Hey, y'all, this is Justin Cato from Texas A&M Commerce. <clears throat> Excuse me. We uh, normally staff two people at our member services check-in desk, and <clears throat> we've seen, because we're not selling as much memberships and guest passes uh, this semester, uh, actually, we're not doing any guest passes, so it's it's mainly just uh, re-ups on, on memberships for those that, are, that have come back. Uh, we reduced there so we could add in our cleaning uh, spots because obviously you know even though our facility is you know not as large as, as some we have you know gone the extra mile to make sure we keep everything clean and sanitized and wiped down um, so we've increased the floor staff and decreased and from decreased. Services, and that's kind of helped um, offset from a budget standpoint of, of staffing more than what we would typically staff we also reduced our building hours which i'm sure most most people did as well just because of usage is not there we're not there. <clears throat> steady but down steady uh you know kind of know when our people are going to come in and uh when it's not it's 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 pretty dead uh not in those peak times yeah i think most of us are seeing our facilities have less people come through our doors than we're used to um, and maybe a new challenge for us is now to how, how do we keep our student employees engaged, um, busy, so that they're not all congregating behind one certain location and it looks like a waste of resources and allocation, but then they're also not following, you know, any maybe social distancing guidelines you might have in place. Um, and so I think for us at the University of Texas at Austin, we haven't necessarily reduced the number of hours that we're open. Our main facility is still open from 6 a.m. until 1 a.m. Uh, most nights of the week. Our numbers are dramatically lower than we're used to seeing, but um, we were able to um, reallocate some staff to different usage in the building where we no longer staff our main ID check-in island. Um, we've gone to a self-scan system for our participants and that freed up that individual who used to sit in that ID island box, as we used to call it, um, to help with other operational things in the building. They um, are confirming that people are scanning their IDs but are at a safe distance but then can also be used for other tasks in the building like cleanings, uh, our hourly or, or throughout the day cleanings to assist with that. Um, how about lifeguards? Anybody use maybe lifeguard staff um, during the, the slower periods of time to help with uh, things inside the building as well? Ours have helped a little bit, um, especially when we've had issues filling positions because because staff don't want to come in so they've been good helping out um, especially since you know our reservation system um, we're doing through fusion when we were open um, we're closed right now for a maintenance issue um, at OSU but they they helped a lot when there wasn't any um, patrons scheduled during those time slots uh, this is Michael Adiemo at Sam Houston State University. Uh, we haven't had to use any lifeguards yet. We've actually been pulling in intramural students um, to come and help out our facility staff. Uh, intramurals is still going on here at campus, but primarily we switched to esports, which is very popular down here. Um, I'm not saying that esports isn't popular, but like you know, it's it's, it's interesting to see it grow. But are we still have those? Uh, Intramural staff members are still hungry for hours. So if we can't get facility staff to come in, they come in and do the job. Hi, this is Rob with uh, UTSA. Uh, yeah, we've been we've been util utilizing sport program staff as well. Uh, we haven't been doing very many intramurals and, and no club sports at all. Um, so we've been using that staff uh, that's, that's looking for hours to fill in holes. Um, Pretty much everywhere else, um, other than the aquatics area, uh, yeah, that's that's been very helpful to have them as we've we've struggled a little bit to to fill our floor shifts. So, kind of going off of that, I know, um, like for us here at the University of Arkansas, like part of us going to or dealing with student staffing is that we had to split up our fitness center equipment going from our traditionally like actual fitness center to there and one of our gyms to be able to spread everything out uh, to deal with occupancy and stuff like that. 
Uh, so I guess the next question to kind of go on is like, how are you all dealing with occupancy? Are you doing it by the certain space itself? So like a fitness center, a gym, a basketball court, are you doing the entire building itself? Uh, and just like, how are you managing that? So are you doing like a one in one out? Are you doing any reservations? Um, if you're doing reservations, what are you doing for that? Like I am leagues fusion or just anything you might come up with that you all have been utilizing. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start. We've got, we actually had a very interesting transition here in terms of our um, capacity system. Uh, when we opened back in July 1st, uh, if anyone didn't know, like we share our building with our kinesiology department. So um, one half is all the, is the weight room and everything and the other half are the basketball courts and the classrooms. So back when we opened in July, since there were any classes going on at the time, we moved our cardio equipment over to our courts um, just to kind of give more space uh, to kind of help out with the capacity a bit. Um, once, the, once the fall semester started, we moved everything back uh, because the, the kinesiology department needed more courts for practices. So now we have been going into a, uh, our, our weight room capacity is about 30 people. Um, we are doing basketball. Um, however, it's more on a, uh, only two people to a goal and they each have to have their own basketball. There's no one-on-one -on -one play. So if we have four courts with eight goals, you know, our basketball capacity is 16 people. Um, we had our fusion reservation system in our pocket. However, we've kind of gone in on the whole one and one out system and we've actually created a, uh, a fun new staff position. We call it rec eight because we have like radio codes and they pretty much have like an old school intramural counter like scoreboard like when that when someone walks in and walks out and they have a radio it's like rec eight to rec three like we're at capacity and so that way like we have like a system where our patrons will either stay in like our in our aisle shoot system which we've also switched up so that way they can wait their turn and it's just like a one in one out system michael is that time based or is it come as you go or come as you want uh it's come as you go So along with that, like kind of what we've been doing here at the University of Arkansas is we do fusion reservations and you sign up for like a 50 minute time slot, but you're not bound to that and you don't have to show up then. And then we also let walk-ins come in after that. So like, is anybody doing it more like that where um, you are like asking people to reserve a time that way you can kind of see beforehand? Because I know like also relating to our student staffing, sometimes we might be down a person on shift with how we're having to double up in spaces. And depending on our reservation numbers, we might not really push people to come in and take that on a sign shift. So are any of you doing something like that or kind of how are you managing um, also like the student staffing along with like what you're expecting people to come in and like how many people are gonna come in during a certain time? So I know Kansas is not doing reservations. Um, I know that Texas A&M was doing a reservation system. And I think that, um, Christian, if you're, on the, if you're on the round table, would you chime in? Are you guys still using that system or have you gone away from it completely? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm in, the, in the car. But uh, we, we're still using reservations via IM leagues for our climbing wall and uh, aquatics areas only. Right before uh, we we went to 75% capacity in the strength and conditioning room, uh, that staff made the decision to keep it at 50%, uh, but then allow those patrons to come and go freely. Um, so we no longer use a, a reservation system in there. Um, we are still using IM leagues for now, um, but we are on the docket to get the new Fusion upgrade here very shortly that will allow us to do uh, the booking functionality. And we'll probably go to that for the aquatics and uh, climbing facilities, just so that those patrons can have a more unified experience. Um, but as of right now, we did move away from, 
from the reservations in the strength and conditioning room we're a little more fortunate um, just with the, the amount of space we have in there uh, we don't typically get to capacity um, i think we've hit it maybe once or twice um, and then when we get into that instance it does become one in one out awesome thank you very much for that christian as you can see there's a lot of people commenting in our chat that a lot of uh, campuses are not using reservation systems. University of Texas at Austin currently is. Um, it, ours is a homegrown system, so it's tough for us to compare it to like IM leagues or uh, fusion. Um, but our student employee or our student participants have the opportunity co to go into um, a, a website that we designed that's built off of our utrexports.org homepage and make a reservation. Um, and they can do, I think one reservation a day for up to seven days in a row. Um, and we have capacities in our activity space is based on the square footage of available usage space. So hours for the main weight room here at Gregory Gym is 50 people per hour or per session. Um, and there are times that that will get close to 50. Our, our capacity will max out. There are also times where there's a lot less than that. So we are currently doing a reservation system for our facilities and, and our strength training locations here at Texas. I can tell you here at Logan University, we're a small program. We are still using IM leads for registration, but we're getting fewer and fewer people registered because we're just not hitting our capacity. And there's just not the need or the motivation to do it. I do foresee us, I mean, we're doing four 75 minute sessions during the day with some time in between. I mean, I foresee us going to like one big morning session and one big afternoon session because it's just not it hasn't been the issue. You know, we plan for the worst that, oh, we're going to be packed and then we're not. So also kind of going along with, um, I guess, just what people are coming in for. I'm not sure about all of you all, but we have quite a few people wanting to come in and like check out equipment to do some certain things, um, like whether it's go play or racquetball or just like shoot a basketball. And we just recently started changing how we're doing equipment checkout to allow that again. So are any of you doing that? Um, have any of you been doing that for a while and kind of what that process has looked like? Have you changed how you're doing? It's like the checkout process, the cleaning and sanitation afterwards. Um, just what have you all kind of learned as you've gone through that throughout the semester? I'll chime in, uh, Jeremy Chance, University of Kansas. So we, at, when we first reopened at the start of the semester, we were super limited as far as we weren't allowing basketball shoot around on more than one goal. So we'd had maybe two indoor basketballs and some outdoor equipment. But as far as our, our fitness equipment goes, we were uh, still, you know, using Fusion for check-in, check-out. Um, you know, all the students were, student staff were sanitizing it as it came back in. So with things like squat belts, dip belts, um, anything that might um, sweat may soak into, you know, the staff was uh, was cleaning that with, you know, our, our sanitizer product and then hanging to dry. And then we weren't checking it back out until it dried as much as it could. Um, but things like as the semester has gone on and we have been asked to provide more basketball courts or more goals for shoot around. Um, we just added more balls to the available shoot around and um, again, spraying and wiping them down as they come in and out. Has anybody been doing checkouts since you all like reopened initially back in either the summer or the start of the fall semester? And how was that process going for you when you first started? And did anything change maybe within like those first few weeks or like within a month or so of doing that? We've been doing checkout equipment since we opened in May um, at SEMO, by the way. Hi. Um, <laughs> And when we started, I mean, we've been checking out all of our equipment literally since we opened. The only thing that we did differently, because we've always sanitized all of our equipment, including basketballs and like everything, um, is just that our kids wore gloves the whole time. And when we took equipment um, before COVID, we would take the students' IDs and hold them in um, our operations center. And then when they turned the equipment back in, we would give their IDs back. So we stopped taking IDs. 
Um, that was the only difference. So we would just hope that we got our equipment back. <laughs> um, and so we've actually started taking IDs again um, now. So we're almost kind of back to normal a lot right now, which is kind of scary and weird, <laughs> I guess, hearing everyone talk because I feel like a lot of people are not, but we're very close to normal aside from wearing masks. Um, we don't have a lot of capacity stuff here right now, other than a lot of our like close quarter areas, um, like our weight room and stuff. Cause a lot of our building is very open air, um, but everything is um, mask required all the time. So even while people are like lifting and running and everything, like we have masks a hundred percent of the time. Um, so a lot of our space is pretty open other than our weight room because it's very close quarters, so. I feel like our area is a lot different than other people's facilities. So it's kind of strange. <laughs> and I've got two follow-up questions oh. if I could. Um, first, are you guys burning through gloves then? Like are, are employees wearing one pair of gloves for the entire shift or is it every time they touch a piece of equipment, they change out gloves? They are changing out gloves. Um, so yeah, we're going through gloves like crazy, um, but our FM facilities management is providing those um, and that's not just our department that's like a campus-wide kind of deal um, so that's that was just kind of a thing that they anticipated providing and we've just been doing that um, so that's been since May um, we were the first pretty much us and then our tech our um, we call it our bookstore but they're not necessarily through the university, but they're on campus. Um, we were pretty much the first two departments to open um, on campus and we've been open since the beginning of summer, um, but we've kind of been the guinea pigs. Um, but, um, but yeah, that was kind of an experiment, but we're all slowly have been opening, but we've been in-person classes and everything. And so campus is mostly normal other than just masks. So it's kind of strange <laughs> hearing a lot of other schools talk um, because I feel like SEMA is kind of the outlier here, it seems like, but um, things are actually pretty normal. We have under 20 active cases because our kids have been so, so good about wearing masks. I mean, we truly are, I, I feel like we're doing really well here. Um, and our student athletes get tested three times a week and we're actually, knock on wood, fingers crossed, we have our first football game this weekend. It's homecoming week, whatever that can be considered. I mean, we're not really doing anything other than wearing school colors and decorating doors, but it's homecoming week here. So um, I don't know, it's been kind of hectic in a sense because we're actually trying to do virtual activities, but also a little bit of like spirit stuff around school. So that's why if you guys were in some of the stuff that I was on Zoom calls yesterday with you guys. Um, it was kind of crazy and I was literally up and running while still trying to be in Zoom calls, but we had a ton of stuff happening in this building yesterday. So I was not super engaged, <laughs> um, but yeah. So um, gloves and other stuff, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted, but did somebody have another question about what we were doing here? That's yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, and I apologize, I'm, I'm putting on the spot and don't necessarily answer if it's, if it's you're gonna, put somebody on blast I know you mentioned you said it feels strange or is it like the department coming to that decision to kind of return to normal or is there you know kind of the pressure maybe for lack of a better word coming from student affairs or that top down to hey we're returning to normal follow along um I think it's kind of a combination um it's yeah I think it's a combination honestly um so we're doing competitive basketball play again um, in the building, which that was kind of, uh, that was in the last like two weeks thing that we were experimenting with. Um, but again, that's what they have to wear masks. And we told the kids that if you start taking your masks off and we notice it, we're taking it away immediately. And they've understood that it's a privilege. It's not a guarantee. And they've been really good about it. Um, and they are excited because it's finally something they get to do on campus. And we've had intramurals. Um, we've had intramural stuff this semester. I know we've talked about, somebody else was talking about esports. Um, we have 500 kids in our esports club. 
So that's huge. Um, so it's been, <laughs> that's been huge this semester for us. Um, so that's um, that's grown a lot this semester too, but our um, intramural and club sports, it's huge as well. Um, so I know I was talking to Tyler as our um, intramural and club sports coordinator. So I don't wanna speak for him. I don't think he's on this call, but I was talking to him yesterday and um, our volleyball intramural starts next week and sign up start, um, ended last night and we went from six teams to 22 teams in a day. Um, so it's, I mean, these kids are just, they want interaction and they want something to do. So we're trying to give them normalcy. And so we're trying in our facility to keep having safety regulations. And so masks, we're requiring it and we're, we're having some limitations on you know, social distancing and we're trying to provide safe stuff, but our university is really trying to give them some sense of normalcy. And like I said, we we only have 22 active cases on campus. Our county numbers are still going up, but our school numbers are going down a lot. I mean, like a month ago, we had over 100 active cases and now we only have 22. So our kids are following the rules because they want to be engaged and do stuff. So we're trying. <laughs> We're trying what we can do. So sorry, I kind of got off topic, but. I think most of us appreciate that because I don't think a lot of us are in the same position. So to hear you guys are returning to somewhat normal operations is encouraging. It's it's doable. Keep your head up, guys. Keep trying. It's doable because it's we're trying it and it, it's working for us so it can happen. Um, I know it's frustrating, but we've been open since May 18th and the kids want it. So. We're trying what we can and the gloves and the masks and the whatever, you know, we're, we're getting there and it's frustrating, but we're trying. <laughs> awesome. Hannah, before y'all break the next one, I'm sorry, I'm got disturbed just a minute ago. Who made that decision? Was it the, was it the president's office that sent that down or are y'all doing it kind of? Which part? I'm sorry. About being the normalcy. Um, so we actually have uh, what we call the EOC, Emergency Operations Committee, and it's a combination of different department heads as well as the president's office, and they've been meeting since, I would assume, February or March. Um, I don't remember what exactly the very um, first meeting was, but they make those decisions. They meet I, at, at least once a week. Um, they usually send out a memo Fridays at 3 p.m. about what they met about and any decisions that they've made that change. And so they let us know what's changing. Um, and the director of my department actually sits on the EOC meetings. And so he usually kind of keeps us in the loop of anything that's changing and where we're going and things like that. I know we got an update, I believe it was yesterday or the day before that the county in general met, including the president of the university, um, about the health department and what direction they're going. And it was, it included the public schools and actually our public schools um, in the county closed for a week today because their cases are going up but our cases at the university are going down. So I don't know what that implies, but <laughs> so, um, but so yeah, so that comes from the EOC is what we just called emergency operations committee. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Justin, I think you raised your hand. Did you have a question? Justin, go. No, I was clapping and praising Hannah for how great they're doing up there at SEMO. <clears throat> Okay, um, I'm Glenn Kemper at Logan University in Chesterfield, Missouri, where it's a suburb of St. Louis. Um, talking about the uh, indoor spaces and have you got, talk about Let's talk about spacing of equipment. Um, have you guys had to uh, move your cardio onto your gym floors or convert racquetball courts if you have them, things like that? Uh, have you had to spread out your resistance or plate loaded machines um, and repurpose other areas, studios, et cetera? Has anybody had to, uh, what are your experiences been like for that? This is, this is Gary from the University of Oklahoma. Um, when we were told we were going to reopen, uh, and we opened in July, 
we actually did kind of what we, we've heard other people talk about. Uh, we actually have eight basketball courts, um, about a 150,000 square foot building. And we, from our basically m main COVID operations uh, director for the campus, has suggested we do everything 12 feet. So we actually moved about 300 pieces of equipment, uh, whether it be cardio, weight equipment, um, and or uh, benches and free weight room stuff. We moved everything onto our basketball court. So we ended up taking up three basketball courts uh, to put some of our weight equipment and then separated everything that remained in uh, at least 12 feet from the user position. And then we, um, we made a decision. Well, we were, we were made to give a decision that we were not gonna allow basketball and or team activities within the facility. So we actually turned four other basketball courts into uh, F45, uh, which is a functional 45. And uh, we took another court and to put all of our uh, recumbent and or upright bikes uh, for either classes that we could, we still were doing uh, fitness classes. And then we made the other two courts, we turned them into a uh, table tennis court and then we have a badminton court. And so we have utilized just about every inch of space and we have left every piece of equipment we had available. Uh, nothing's been stored. Um, and we've gotten pretty, we've had a lot of people tell us they like that. It gave them a very good sense of safety by coming back. Um, you know, and then on top of all the protocols that we have cleaning all the time, big heavy cleaning at night when we close. Um, and so we, it took us three days uh, to move everything prior to opening. Uh, and I, I was allowed to actually bring my staff back to campus because they shut down campus. And uh, we were one of the very few departments allowed to come back to campus to uh, prepare the building for that. Gary, if I can ask a follow-up to that, um... What kind of numbers are y'all seeing in your fitness and wellness classes that you move to your basketball court? Um, for F45, when we had it in a small racquetball room, you know, with TVs and everything, it was full most of the classes. Um, we are now experiencing less class use, um, but some of our classes will have between two and about six participants. Um, um, I, I know that we have altered our schedule. Uh, when, when we first started it at the beginning of the year, we, we were probably like everyone else, we were expecting to kind of be overran um, with even with our limitations. And we were prepared to have a counter for not only getting into the building, but for these classes, uh, we were making them do everything on a reservation basis. And the numbers just didn't hold. Um, and so we've allowed for our group fitness classes, whether it be a, uh, you know, a, a Pilates class or a bar class, all those things. Um, some of the things we've allowed for them to do online, which has helped uh, kind of eliminate them coming to our campus. So the online activity for these, for these classes have actually stayed fairly steady. And that will be anywhere between four and sometimes we'll have 12 to 13 people online. Uh, so that community is kind of, has actually gotten smaller, but they've been consistent. Um, and so, but that the F45 is really one of the few activities that we are allowing people to come in person uh, because we've used, again, we've used a uh, full basketball court to separate and we've given everyone their own set of equipment. Uh, so we still have those who are still uneasy about coming. Um, but the, the, percentage of what we've done, we've, we've looked at our numbers based upon last year, you know, obviously normal academic year compared to what we are and almost daily and weekly and by month, um, everything, we are down 33%. Uh, but we are also only allowing up to about 100 people in the building. And we've never gotten close to that, not even close. Gotcha. Thank you for that information. Hey, also, I'd ask if people are in like in their weight rooms, if there are uh, free weight areas, are you taping off boxes or 
indicating spaces at all. I, I can tell you here at Logan, we're just putting some little stickers on the ground every about eight foot or so. Uh, we don't have set boxes, just some, you know, some visual cues of spacing. And also in our floor area, stretching area, we have that as well. Other people doing similar? So I can talk a little bit about what we're doing here at Arkansas. Um, so we have some spaces where it's like boxes taped out and then we have somewhere just the equipment spaced out depending on what it is. Uh, so for instance, in one of our gyms is where we have all of our cardio equipment that doesn't need to be plugged in. That way it can be kind of spread out throughout the court. And then that's also where we have our free weight area set up. So in that on top of our like, um, rubber flooring that we put out on top of the gym court, we've got eight different squares that are taped out. Um, and then we have the free weights where people like take the weights to their square, do their workout, then we'll go clean them and put them up after. Uh, and we also have uh, shower curtains hanging between the squares. Um, for us, it's a little different than I think most states where I think for most of you all, you'll have to have like people wearing their mask the entire time they're working out. From our state Department of Health, um, people are allowed to take their face covering off if they're actively working out. So anytime they're going around our facility, they have to have it on. But whenever they're like on a piece of equipment, so on a treadmill, on a uh, like selectorized machine or in their square, they can take it off. Um, so then in our fitness center, that's where we have like our selectorized machines and our treadmills and our squat racks and that stuff. Um, everything's just spaced out at least 12 feet. That's what we have to go by if there's no barrier. Uh, so that when people are taking their mask off, they're pretty spaced out. But then up at our uh, fitness center that we have in our student union, we don't have nearly as much space there. So we have a whole lot of shower curtains hanging as barriers throughout so that we can go with the six foot rule instead of the 12 foot rule. Uh, so it looks a little uh, interesting up there to say the least with so many shower curtains hanging around everything. Uh, but that's kind of how we're doing spacing and how that kind of also relates to um, like people having to wear like their face covering in the building. Because I know Shane was asking about that, like how in the chat, how you're dealing with that. So I know we're having some struggles dealing with that because we have to have people wear it if they're going between equipment. So if they're going to get a wipe to wipe it down before or after use or anything like that, they have to have it on. And we're really having to have our staff like pretty much patrolling around the weight room, like looking for anybody that's breaking that rule to go tell them. Um, so kind of along with like the equipment setups and everything in your facility, I guess, kind of wondering what people are also doing for enforcing all of that with face coverings in the building. Are there any other schools or states where they don't have to have it on for the entire time? Um, like anything kind of like us where they can take it off or for most of you, do they have to have it on for the entire time they're in the building? Uh, we, we do that here at SAM. Um, when they are actively exercising, they can take off their mask, but when they're moving from station to station, their mask has to stay on. Um, I think right now we're just kind of going through that process of uh, enforcing that policy um, thoroughly with student staff, uh, just making sure that they are clear across the board. As far as like our weight room, how it works is uh, we have most of our like equipment spaced out six feet, and then we have like uh, X and X labels that we change on the alternate schedule. So that way, like, you know, if you can't use this bench one day, you're gonna use the bench tomorrow. Um, and that's also, you know, when the semester started, it kind of took a while to get into the rhythm of it because you'll have patrons that like don't see the X or they don't see them, they don't see that this machine is unavailable to use and they'll use it anyway. Um, we've gotten a lot better at effect, uh, enforcing that. One of the things that we did at our facility is since we're not allowing, uh, we don't allow racquetball as well. And we still have a couple of racquetball courts. And what we did was that we put signs on the racquetball court doors to allow those that, uh, because we, we do mandate everyone wear a mask other than when you're getting a drink. So during a workout, you are supposed to be masked at all times in our building. But we did, we do have three unused racquetball rooms that we put on as a mask relief area. And so uh, someone, if they are really needing to uh, get the mask off, they can walk over to one of the areas as long as nobody's in there, they can go inside and take off their mask and they have five minutes. Um, we've actually had quite a few people go in and use them. Um, they are right off of our cardio equipment. So 
everybody can see them. Uh, and it seems to have been a good help for a few people. Uh, we did find uh, a gentleman in there working out one day because nobody had been in there. And so we walked by and he's in there doing push-ups, setups, doing calisthenics without his mask on. And we just kind of let him ride for a little bit until we had to ask him that, you know, to utilize the space that was as it was asked to be used. So, um, but the mask relief area, that was a, um, the way we could utilize our space and it could be something because it was a challenge obviously like most of us have all probably experienced of people wanting to pull the mask off while they're working out and the one of the things that we told everyone it's it's similar to high altitude training and after about a week and a half of being here once people came in they never complained again they just would do it so hey michael i did um, how, how well are people, and once they're done exercising, how well are they putting their mask back on? Is it a lot of reminding or are they getting better at it? I, I would say it's overall, I would say overall it's well. Obviously, you know, we have the patient every now and then, you just have to remind. Um, and I think it's just more of like, you know, training the staff to like, you know, to see it through. You know, once you talk to that patient, like, you know, you talking to them is that warning if you have to let them know two, three more times, then, you know, the next step is taken. Overall, it's been pretty good. Okay. And Hannah, you look like you were going to say something. I was just going to say, starting off, our mask policy was kind of difficult because ours is the most restrictive. So our state policy and county policy is like, if you're able to socially distance or you're doing physical activity, you can take it off but um, our university and rec services policy is the most restrictive saying that it doesn't matter if you're socially distanced and it doesn't matter if you're doing physical activity that um, our policy on campus and in our building states that you will wear a mask and because you're in our building you're following our policy. Um, so with our students um, if they're not willing to follow the policy um, one if they're, um, which we've had a couple of these, if they're going to be verbally disrespectful and combative in inappropriate ways, they can actually be sent to student conduct. Um, and we had a couple of those. Um, and then two, um, in some of the dorms, I've heard they're actually sending them to student conduct as well, and they can actually be charged because they're not following student conduct policies. And so they can be fined by getting um, not following conduct. Um, and then they can also try to go the route of going through um, disability services if they are saying, you know, oh, I um, can't wear a mask because of whatever, you know, it may be that that requires them to not be able to wear a mask. So if that is true, then student disability services can contact us and tell them tell us that um, they they do have that restriction. However, we don't have any students who have been given that permission um, because if that is in fact true, they've been told that they should probably not come to the rec center during a pandemic and um, not wear a mask because it's probably not safe for them. So they should probably find alternative means and whatever. And that's kind of what we've been told. Um, and so we haven't really had any community members that that's become an issue with. Um, so I'm not really sure exactly what route I would go with that at this point because we haven't had that come up. It's always been students, um, but that's kind of how we've addressed that. But our most, we, the university is the most restrictive policy. So um, it's kind of been interesting trying to get people to understand that as the university, we can have more restrictive policies than um, the county and what that states. So it was an interesting start to get them to get that at first. Hey, another topic would be locker rooms and showers. How are you guys adjusting those and new, you know, not new uses, but limiting usage and policies on that? Because that's a that affects everybody. Hi, I'll uh, chime in, Christine from University of Houston. When we first opened, we did not allow people to use the main locker rooms and showers, but since over time. Uh, we now allow people to use the locker room, the restrooms, but each stall and shower, uh, every other one is locked and marked off. Like you cannot use the shower. 
Um, and then pretty much that's how that works. And we are not allowing um, like rented lockers. People right now cannot rent lockers. They have to use our day use lockers. Hey Glenn, this is uh, Christian with Texas A&M. We, when we first reopened back in May, uh, we also did not let folks in the locker rooms. Uh, so our women's locker room actually had a, an accordion door that was closed and locked to keep folks from coming in and out. The men's locker room, we actually had to uh, have our maintenance team just build uh, a door out of plywood uh, that we locked uh, that was temporary. About two weeks in, we actually got approval to reopen those with some limitations. Uh, so we, we have locker bays um, and we have signs posted that no more than two people can be in a bay at a time. Um, that is all self-regulated. We don't staff anybody like a locker room attendant or anything like that. Um, when we, we have uh, individual stall showers uh, with curtains, we left those uh, open for regular usage, um, but we did close the group showers uh, in both the men's and women's locker rooms. I can tell you here at Logan, uh, we didn't have lockers in the locker rooms. We just had cubbies and it's open for restroom facilities only. So we've taken the cubbies out and we've taken the shower head, the little shower heads off there too. So they're not showering. Okay, hey, I have another question here. It's gonna be a bit off slides. Anybody have theories of why our usage is so down? Is this people are afraid? People are using local facilities? People just not exercising? People not being on, well, for us, we're a commuter school. So a lot of people just aren't on campus. And so they're not coming back. Um, and if there's any strategies to try to get more people or do we want more people? I know for I know for us a big reason why our numbers went down is because we aren't doing um, full basketball. We're not doing uh, volleyball. You know, club sports are participating, so the numbers have dropped down dramat dramatically. And personally, I don't really mind it. <laughs> I think um, most of our disciplinary issues with patrons have always been more in the courts because, you know, like we'd have a no dunking policy or, or, you know, people get into fights or anything like that. So since then it's been drastically down. Um, and it's, it's funny, like, you know, San Huntsville is a kind of a small town. So everyone kind of sees everybody. So if I'm around campus, I'll have patrons come and ask me like, you know, like when's basketball coming back? I'm like, when we're told it can come back and you just never see them again. But other than that, it's been um, pretty interesting. Yeah, at the University of Kansas, I think I think it's in part due to just the way that they've shifted um, class offerings. You know, I think there's only maybe 30 to 40 percent of classes that are in person. So we think just the on campus presence is is down overall. So I think that's that's partially impacting it. Similar to Michael's point. Yeah, we don't, we're not allowing competitive basketball. So of our six basketball courts, you know, we'd have five on five running all the time. So that's driving usage down too. Um, but I think also because we do require masks during exercise, there are enough other, you know, Planet Fitness and other gyms in Lawrence um, that don't require masks. So I think they're going to go pay the $10 fee to just, you know, be able to exercise without a mask elsewhere. And faculty and staff too, we're seeing that's an issue we're having too. Mm -hmm. uh, I know similar to what everybody else has said, but we also aren't um, allowing student organizations to make reservations in our space right now. Um, so all those dance groups, meetings, uh, uh, other student practices and things like that aren't happening. Um, at this point, we're working to try to get those back on the docket, but that's a pretty significant portion of, of space that isn't being utilized by those organizations as well on, an, on pretty much a nightly basis.
So we also wanted to have a conversation about uh, maintenance and custodial and long-term upkeep because for the University of Texas at Austin, we're kind of getting a glimpse that the spring is going to be run very similar to how the fall of 2020 has been run as far as, uh, you know, for reading the tea leaves, that's what we're looking at right now. And so with that in mind, we, you know, we wanted to have a conversation about um, inventory control of things like your PPE, your gloves, your hand sanitizer, your masks, if you're providing them for your staff. And so um, has anyone thought about what their spring is going to look like or run into any issues? Or if you're doing, um, if your equipment PPE is being provided by your university, I think like Heather, like Hannah mentioned earlier, um, you know, then you may not have a shortage of your supply chain coming, but you know, if there was any conversation you wanted to have about it. So this is Anthony from University of Central Arkansas. Um, you know, we we already saw the 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 headlights. You know, about when you talk about the PPE, like the the wipes, things like those. Um, so we went ahead and went with ordering about 150, 200 spray bottles with about 500 microfiber cloth rags. So we encourage patrons to use those items when they are using the equipment um, because we we see that the wipes are going to be you know, short everywhere, uh, you know, later this fall and then coming in the spring. Uh, as far as the other PPE stuff, uh, the, the gloves, I think that, that that's going to be fine. I don't see an issue like we'll have a shortage of those. Um, the university has got together with our purchase, purchasing department and they have been ordering uh, large bulk orders because they know everybody's going to be requesting that. Um, I'm looking at your little notes here. Uh, space closures, we're still we're already doing that now from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday, and we use a mister and we spray uh, equipment and then high touch areas from there. Anthony, thank you for that. If I could ask a follow up, are those microfiber towels? Those are I'm guessing it's a communal system where you know you just drape them and, and people can come and pick up that towel in the spray bottle and spray it on their machine as needed and then put it back. Is your staff laundering them? Are you concerned about cross contamination at all? Yeah. So, uh, so basically, we have a table. Let's just call it a beer pong size table, and we have a handful of those throughout our facility, and we have stacks of uh, laundered and clean rags, uh, and then of course the bottles are also on that table, and then we have a um, uh, you know one of the Lowe's buckets that basically says put your dirty rags here, and then. Um, Throughout the day, depending on the, the the usage, we probably launder you know two to three hundred rags um, a, a day, throughout each day, and we have probably another three to five hundred um, rags that are literally still sitting in boxes. So if we ever get you know overran or anything like that with an issue, uh, we can always backfill those. Awesome, thank you. So I have a question about kind of gloves for people too. Um, so my guess is probably everybody like us is going through gloves pretty quickly with all the cleaning and stuff like that, that you're having to do. Um, is everybody using medical grade gloves for everything? Because I know we like used to do that, but what we've gone to is to make sure we're not going through those is we're using food prep gloves to let our staff use uh, throughout their shifts, whether it's like if they just want to have them while working or when they're like specifically going and cleaning the equipment. So is anybody doing that? Or is anybody staying with like, no, we're using the medical grade gloves for everything we do in the building? The University of Texas at Austin, we still continue. We have a pretty good supply of our uh, nitrile gloves, the powder-free latex-free gloves that we seem to be working pretty well. We haven't had to consider food prep gloves yet. Um, we're the same at Texas A&M. We have a pretty good supply and we actually, when things are getting pretty low, we shifted to a distributor that was selling to tattoo parlors. So we we're using those type of gloves too. Hmm. Yeah, early in the summer, we actually did the same thing with the uh, auto body shop distributor. Um, and we were able to find some gloves from an auto body shop distributor.
what about like um so any changes or any are we still finding any uh hesitations or or issues that you've worked through with maybe if you're doing a third party contractor for your cleaning services or if the university cleans your facility or if you're if you're just relying on your students to to clean your facilities have you found any issues or any topics you want to talk about about with that we've got a about five minutes left four minutes left in our time together so we want to make sure we hit on anyone that any questions you might have is anybody going to be you being used as a voting site an election site coming up here The University of Texas at Austin, we're currently being used as a voting site. Uh, one of our facilities, Gregory Gym, is currently being used as a voting site that started um, a couple of weeks ago and will go all the way through election day, I think with two days off where um, we get a little rest or some breaks in the counting. But we are being used as a voting site. What's unique about our facility is that the space is being used for that uh, allocation has a dedicated entry and a dedicated entry, uh, exit. So egress and entry um, is all separate from coming in our facility if you were coming to work out in our facility. Um, and so that's managed primarily by the um, Travis County Elections Bureau and board with support from our team as far as uh, we did some of the setup, but the actual operations of that space is being managed primarily by the uh, election committee. Okay, we just got a few more minutes. Anybody have any other questions, concerns that they want to ask? So I think I'm gonna make a, a just kind of a general statement here. And I think Taylor, I'd be curious to hear his thoughts since he's just north of us. Um, I'll be honest, our Department of Health uh, helped and kind of hurt us at the beginning and then throughout this phase uh, because they gave us a lot of guidance of how we needed to operate, you know, our types of facilities throughout the state. And when I say they helped and they hurt us because we didn't have to answer to someone that said, well, why is that a, a policy or a rule? Why are you following it? You know, we can literally go to them, you know, you know, say hey, that's the Department of Health that stated we had to do this. At the same time, it kind of hurt us because they put the a 12 foot distance um, when exercising. And what's kind of funny is that where is that there that, that that theory is nowhere else in the especially in the us the 12 feet and so we were trying to figure that concept out so yeah just kind of touching on that um i just kind of walked into that because i just started here in the middle of the summer after we already had most of our plans kind of set up um but i know like i just finished my undergrad at tennessee and like it sounds like there it's the six foot rule all around but they have to have their mask on so i think like the State Department of Health just kind of essentially doubled it just to get more space since we are allowing people to take their mask off while working out. Um, but it definitely did cause some problems for us when trying to figure out like how to fit everything, which is why in one of our spaces we ended up just doing a whole lot of like pipe and drape rods with shower curtains to create that barrier between. So that was the main way we were able to get around that. All right, well, once again, we wanted to say thank you very much for your participation this morning. Uh, the Region 4 Facilities Committee does have another roundtable scheduled this afternoon. If you're looking for something to fill your 3.30 time frame with, please join us again. Well, during that conversation, we will be talking about outdoor facilities um, and how the challenges of COVID-19 have impacted um, our outdoor facilities. So again, thank you for the spirited conversation this morning. We appreciate you being here and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Remember our sponsors.